Okay, dry run. So, here we are. This is Earth, as you can clearly see from the continents. Anyways, here we are on Earth. One big happy family. No, not really. Some people are doing well. Some people have food, shelter. Some people are able to live fairly happy lives. And some people on this planet are living in uh, horrible, horrible uh, situations. And so here's another way to look at that. So, the people, if you look at this as Earth, this is Earth. This would be sort of an abstract look at Earth. Some people are living in, people that are living in pretty good shape will make those little spirals of happiness and wealth. So that would be a spot on Earth where people are doing okay. Or at least some of the people in the spiral are doing okay. Here's another spot people are doing okay. Here's a little spiral where people are doing okay. Here's another spot where people are doing okay. Little spots where people are doing okay. Maybe some of these are big nations, big wealthy nations like the United States. And then there's the rest of the world outside of these spirals, which is a dark, dark place where dark, horrible things happen. Unspeakable things, things I don't even want to say out loud. Now these spirals are not necessarily entire countries, they're really, you could just think of them as like the lives of individual people. Some people live in these bubbles of safety and security, comfort, wealth, and others do not. They live in this darkness. So, what is the challenge of humanity? What I mean, what really is the challenge of humanity since beginning of time? It is, um, as a people, how can we make these bubbles of health and safety and comfort and growth become bigger so that they take up more of the darkness so that we, as many people as possible, are living happy, flourishing lives. Give these each some. A little bit of color. How do we do that? How do we make these bigger? Well, something has changed in the last hundred years. In fact, less than that since the about the late 90s something has changed in the world because this really is if you think of these as pockets of of uh, fairly decent living and decent happiness in the world and these as pockets of darkness what has changed technology the internet and so a lot of these places and what we might do is we might create some black black pits of despair in here these are where the really horrible crap happens and we know where these are these are in war-torn countries where the worst possible crap is happening in the most impoverished nations on earth and you know even in the wealthy nations there's pockets you know right well, let me make like right here there's a pocket of horrible crap happening right in or near you know, wealthy nations. This is the way life has always been for humanity. But with technology, something new has happened. Technology has given every single person that lives, no matter where you live in this map of pretty, you know, comfort and decent living, decent standard of living, whether or you're in a pit of despair, if you have any level of uh, telecommunications, then you are able to connect to the internet. And what that means is everyone can suddenly 
communicate with everyone else. And this fundamentally changes the potential for how we might deal with all the crap that is going on here. Now, it doesn't mean everyone is communicating with everyone else. People in this wealthy nation over here may not be communicating with the people in this you know, war-torn, suffering nation, but the potential is there. And some people are communicating. And so our challenge now, those of us who actually care about this map and wanting this map to be not filled with black, horrible, dark places with horrible suffering, we want it to be a, a map where there are nothing but bright spirals, places where people have enough food, people have health care, people have basic human rights, and maybe each of these little bubbles of... Uh, of decent standard of living, decent lives. Maybe each one um, has some slightly different ideas of what these basic human rights are and the basic standard of living should be, and that's fine. But I think hopefully everyone watching this video would agree we don't want any of these pits of despair where torture and just um, just completely unjustified violence happens without any recrimination or any consequence, where people cannot feel safe, where people uh, cannot get adequate food to eat, where people are unable to um, find warmth and basic shelter from the elements, where people are unable to adequately take care of their families. I mean, we all, naturally, we all want to live in these, uh, in a nice bubble of happiness, um, a bubble where we have enough wealth and money. But I think most of us would agree we want this to be a better picture. And we want to try to figure out how to make the world that way. So, how do we do that? Well, we need to understand the way these pockets work in the world so that we can see how we can transform this and how we can take advantage of these interconnections that we are now possible between all of these uh, what you might call all these islands of the human spirit islands of humanity so let's look at this let's look at one of these in three dimensions Okay, so here we have a, a pocket of decent living in the world today. Call this the United States. What does that look like? What does this look like in three dimensions? What it looks like is this. This is the United States. And each, what this could be, what you could think of this as, is basically a symbol, uh, symbol for every single person in the United States. Every one of these dots making up this form is a person in the United States. All the way up here, there are people up there. And your position in this shape, which is kind of a squished pyramid, indicates the amount of power you have in this entity, this uh, organization that is the United States. And if we are to look at it, this is, it is, that is the vertical of it. This is the, this is down, this is up. More, further up here, the more powerful you are. And power can be measured in a lot of different ways. One way you can measure it is wealth. And if this was to be to scale an accurate picture of wealth in the United States, it, this is probably pretty still far off. It'd probably look more like 
something like that, well, except for not with this like bulge at the top. Um, and it might even be worse than that. It might be more like that. This down here would be the middle class. And this, the upper 1%, and up here, the upper 0.1%. And down here would be the bulk of people. So in any case, that is what one of these pockets look like. And each of these pockets, if we go back to this, each one of these looks like that. So we have over here, another nation, another country, another, another place. Every single nation on Earth is a warped pyramid of power. Some, perhaps, less warped than others. But in today's age, they're all pretty warped. And obviously, some um, countries are more powerful than other countries, and you just make their warped pyramid a different size based on that. Each one of these, of course, is made up of millions of people, depending on the population of the country. And if we are going to say that um, these pits, these black pits of despair are the, if we're going to just say that those are the nations where the most horrendous stuff is going on, the reality is, is those pits of despair are still flattened pyramids. It's just the, the vast majority of the people in the country are doing horrible. And there's always, there's always an elite class that is doing, uh, doing well, you know, even if it's just like warlords or something. Um, or the dictators, you know, in a country where there is a authoritarian rule that the few that are in power are the ones, are the little spike of the pyramid. So that's the world. That's the world in three dimensions, all the pits of despair and all the wealthy nations. Um, obviously without putting them all on the map or just sort of this is just sort of a metaphor for us to see and you know the reality is is that the upper parts of these pyramids are the places where things are going pretty well and the lower parts are where you are the most poor and the struggling the most so the lower parts of these pyramids would be where more dark darkness and horrible uncomfortable, difficult things happen. And some of these pyramids probably need to have an even wider base to really accurately indicate. Okay, so here's the world. So what do we do to get this world to be bigger and bigger spirals of good living? Good standard of living, good um, safety, uh, opportunity, opportunity to live a decent life and to flourish. Well, you have to understand that power is what shapes the world. Power. And again, these pyramids are about power. Wealth is only one measure of power, you know. I mean, sometimes a person can have power just by their their voice, their influence, but, in, you know, that puts them in a different spot. So, here we have the powers of the world. So, yeah, we need to understand that the way the world decides how to use its resources, because 
if you think about each of these, these have the ability to do things. This is collective power of this population. This collective power can put a man on the moon. It can launch a war against another nation. It can build a giant wall between its nation and another country. This can do anything, though. this collective power, anything that you can do with the tax money of this population or the collective willpower, however else you harness it, this is wielded by this organism. But this organism is controlled by the top. This entity is controlled. All of these are controlled by the top of their hierarchy of power. And this has served humanity okay. I mean, it's the best we could come up with, you know, from the time of uh, civilization first starting is you come up with a leader. Otherwise, it's just sort of, um, you know, I mean, these leaders emerge. I mean, especially if you look at these war trends, these leaders emerge out of chaos. A, and, it, and, you know, you don't really have, it's not like they emerge out of a truly flat situation. I mean, uh, when a country is war-torn, what you have is you have little pockets of power. Warlords, you might say, in some of these situations. And in some countries, that's the way it is. It's like they have these... And this is probably more accurate for these war-torn nations, that they have little pockets of power. Or if they have a civil war, they have two spears of power competing against one another. Because that's what these people in these hierarchies, they do. They, you know, sometimes representing their country and the interest of their country, they're competing with the other pockets of power and, you know. Um, but basically what happens is the people in power, the people that rise up these pyramids tend to be people that like power. And people that like power and that are drawn to power tend to be very flawed. Um, not a lot of people climb the power pyramid because they love all of the people, even in their country. Usually they have many flawed motivations. But another way to look at it is simply that power corrupts. You know, an absolute power corrupts absolutely. So in these places where the powerful have literally have the ability to do whatever they want, places where they have an authoritarian regime where they can just put you in jail, uh, kill you, disappear you, you know, and this happens in all sorts of countries on earth, all sorts of places. And even in the Western democracy, the, the state has extraordinary power. Um, and the, the wealthy um, have extraordinary power to, um, to do things that the people lower in the pyramid do not have. Because people up the pyramid, they have the, the full resources of the legal system at their disposal and the most expensive lawyers at their disposal. And, you know, money is power. You can do things with money. If a person up here wants to destroy the life of a person down here and they, you know, a little bit of money, a little creative investing, it's not that hard to do, even legally. So power corrupts. So basically what I'm saying is that the way you get, the way we're going to get this picture to have more bigger, beautiful uh, pockets of good health and happiness is we need to change these pyramids because these pyramids are dysfunctional. Especially, let's take the U.S., this U.S. pyramid. The people up here in the power structure of the U.S., especially these at the top, I mean, if they wanted to figure out a way to make healthy, happy, flourishing lives spread so that the pyramid became um, wider and so these got lifted up, maybe, maybe you could imagine the pyramid being maybe shaped into something like this. You could still have, like, this powerful elite, but, you know, it's just like... Why not try to make the whole pyramid have enough uh, wealth so that they could all uh, 
have enough food and health care to live a happy life. Why not? Why not try for that? Why not? Because the people up here, that, that is not, either they don't know how to do it or they're really not motivated to do it. Because the way you get up here to the top of this pyramid is you have to get the help of people right here in the middle of the pyramid. And the way you get the people in the middle of the pyramid to help you get up here is <clears throat> they will ask you to do them favors and they'll help you get up here. And so it's like, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And so all the people up here are doing is like, they're negotiating with one another. Here, I'll donate to your campaign if you help my corporation make a ton of money. Okay, cool, blah, blah, blah. And that's, you know, so it's like, so that's what happens. And I mean, another way to put look at it, even if you have good motivations as you climb this and you become a representative or a senator or even president of the United States, you have to do spend so much energy fighting and bickering on how you climb up this power ladder so that it's very hard to really think about how do we make the world look like this? How do we make a nation look like this? And truly, I mean, look at this versus this. This probably entails this pyramid getting squashed down a bit. Maybe, you know, taxing. Maybe it might involve like taxing some of these up here to bring it down to, to make it so we can make schools better and make healthcare more available to the lower parts of the pyramid. But the people up here, I mean, just you know, human nature is just you're self-interested and you're going to protect what you have. And so it's very hard to expect the people with power at the top of the pyramid to choose to lower themselves in the wealth pyramid in order to make society better. Not a lot of humans, it's just not a really natural human incentive. So what do we do? Well, what has happened throughout the course of history is that uh, people down here, as these pyramids get out of whack, eventually they just tear the whole thing down in a big rebellion. And the French Revolution, the American Revolution, um, the, the Arab Spring, you name it, every revolution is basically about the people tearing down the pyramid. But what they then do is they replace the pyramid, they build it again. So it just, and then the cycle continues. So what we need is a different solution. And that different solution is goes back to this. It's a solution that was never possible before. And that solution is built on the fact that every single human can now, almost every single human, every single human that has any level of internet access can be a part of the power structure. And what does that look like? Well, the ordinary now let's look down, maybe we look down at one of these pyramids from the top. And you've got a handful of people here with the actual decision-making power in the country to decide whether or not we go to war or we raise taxes or we invest in schools or we invest in healthcare or we invest in cancer or we put a man on the moon. These are the people that actually have the power to make that decision. And then you have all the other people. Let me make these a little bit better. These are all the other people. And we're only going to show a few of them just so that we get the principle across. Okay. So here are the people in power and they have a, you know, chambers and rooms in Congress and they, they go there and this is, they communicate. They all can communicate with one another. Boom, 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 and they make a decision, you know, and they negotiate and they bribe one another or whatever, or they make some argument. Maybe occasionally they actually make an eloquent argument and convinces the other to do something. That's the power structure. That is the vertical pyramid. So, and with technology being um, what it was 100 years ago, that if you had a million people here, you had to limit the decision-making power to a few. But... We live in a technology age where, in theory, every single person here could have participate in the decision-making process because we can all communicate. But how do you do that? How do you make it not chaos? Well, I mean, step one is the communication. So every single 
being is part of a network connected to one another so that they can communicate ideas, questions, answers, They can reach out and communicate with any other part of the node, any other node in the network that they want to at any one time. Step one is egalitarian communication. And this the internet and technology has given us. Now, and what we have here, you could basically say, is the internet, is Facebook, is Twitter, is YouTube, is Instagram. We are more connected than ever before. But how do we turn this into a decision-making machine? You need a way to turn this into, yeah, into a decision-making machine. Well, if you look at this, what you see is, um, basically it's a neural network. Or another way to look at this is it's like, it's like a hive. And I think a hive is the best way to think about this. Because that's the, the way you turn, you change the power structure of this pyramid and you give everyone in the pyramid power to help this entity decide what to do, is you need to flatten the power structure. And the way you do that is you connect everyone and you give them all the power to decide. And so instead of a pyramid, going instead of a pyramid you have you have a hive hive of power and now this hive needs to decide what it's going to do and maybe we need to make it, let's be realistic, the hive is still going to, if you take this, and you make everyone in it equal power, you still, you're not, it's not as if you're suddenly taking the wealth from these members and giving it to those members. So it's still, um, there's still an uneven wealth power structure, but In terms of power, suppose it maybe it'll look something like this. Or maybe if we are, or maybe we actually can say it looks like this. Yeah, I think that's really what we're going for. We're going for a completely, and this is literally one person high. Now, in terms of who has food and shelter and power, you still will have uh, an uneven distribution of wealth. But in terms of power, the power structure is flat. That's a flattened power structure. That is what you can do with a hive. And now, this entire group this entire flattened power structure can decide what, what it's going to do. What it's going to do with the fact that these nodes are doing okay. And they have comfort, wealth, jobs, and opportunity, and money. And these nodes in the, the network are not. will really change the conversation if power is equal. So how do you do that? Well, you literally create a decision-making platform that does this. You create a hive. 
And that is what I'm working on. And what this is, if you have 10 people in a room or 20 people in a room, the way you do this is with consensus facilitation. And consensus facilitation is something that I've learned a lot about over the last few years and was first introduced to during the Occupy movement. Um, or not first introduced you, but where I first really started to understand how you do consensus in a truly egalitarian way in the Occupy movement. I was a uh, facilitator, a workshop facilitator in a uh, semi-corporate environment before the Occupy movement. But it was during Occupy where I learned how to look at a room of people and start to recognize that um, that you, the way you facilitate a group in an egalitarian manner, you have to be incredibly sensitive to the power that each person has. Now, if you look at this like a, a uh, um, like a group being facilitated in a consensus meeting, there is a very important role here, and that is the facilitator. So the facilitator, or the facilitation team, we put over here. And let's make that a little star here. This is the facilitator. Dun. Facilitator has a role here in making this high function. The other thing um, that you have to make a high function is you have to have a uh, some agreements about how, how the hive will work, has some agreements to the rules of how this hive will work. Um, and the facilitator's role is basically an extension of that. The facilitator's role is to basically keep the agreements, enforce the rules, so that power is kept distributed equally. Well, let's see where we should go from there. Um, yeah. Maybe we can look at this way. So if you look at a mass of people um, in a room, and here we already have this picture drawn, and since I put so much effort into it, well, we'll just use this. But this is a mass of people in a room, and what you have with a mass of people in a room is you have uh, chaos if there's no agreements or rules. And basically, that is the worst talk bubble. Here we go, here we go, there we go. There's someone, blah, 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 they're saying something. And someone over here saying something. So people speak, and this is like Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. People just start talking. Facebook does an interesting thing. It says, we're going to allow you to identify your friends so that you can have little chaotic communication bubbles here just with your friends. Other bulletin boards and YouTube and Twitter, they just, they just let it be a big blob of chaotic communication and they let different talk bubbles rise to the top using different techniques, you know, upvotes or retweets or whatever make some ideas sort of bubble up and become very well heard. And you might, that alone, that idea of upvotes and retweets or likes, these are mechanisms, these are tactics that help a mass of people uh, sift out ideas and thoughts. And it's the best that we've sort of come up with so far. But it's not the best that we can have because it's still basically chaos and the things that come out are pretty random and disorganized and it's not enabling it's not enabling humanity to function like this to actually take its collective uh, mind power the, the 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 CPU processing power that is contained in every um, human mind and allow it to say how can we fix this world how can we make things better. It doesn't allow us to say who should, um, should our country be at war with Iraq or Afghanistan or should we go to war or should, uh, what should the world do in reaction to uh, Russia invading the Ukraine. It's not allowing this, this mind to actually focus and really um, make decisions as a unified whole. It's, it's basically just sort of chaos. And so what happens is you have some things bubble up 
but you still have individuals that have different types of megaphones. And this is that's what this clearly is, if you can't tell. This is a megaphone. And a megaphone is basically someone that has a lot of influence or power in this room for whatever reason. Maybe they have a lot of money and so they can uh, promote their voice more or maybe they um, they're just really popular on the platform. They have a lot of followers and so they have a stronger voice or they, you know, if you look at this as the the entire world and all the communication that takes place, the megaphones are the mass media, the radio, television, and so on. So it's basically still chaos. So how do we get it to look like this? Well, we have to do it with some thought. And you have to do it like you would design a hive. And there's a couple principles to make a hive a hive. Um, and a few of these principles that, um, but I'll, I'll talk more about those principles. But basically, how do you create a hive mind of humanity? This is the short answer. You try. You experiment. You fail. And then you try again. That's how you create. <clears throat> That's how you create the hive mind of humanity. If you want to see what I'm doing, and this is what I'm working on, um, if you go to hive1.net, you'll see my first live experiment. And I have a couple beta uh, in development hives also going, but this is the first one that is sort of open for business. Hive1.net, you go in, and um, Now, I guess I do need to talk about one of the principles of the hive. How do you create a hive mind and how do you stop it from being chaos? One thing that you have to do is you have to figure out how to make uh, this hive have only one node per person. If you create a hive where a person can create two, three or four nodes that represent themselves, that make it look like they are four people, then a person can make themselves look like they're a thousand people or a million people. And this is the way Reddit is, this is the way Twitter is, and actually it's the way even Facebook is. But of all the different uh, social media networks out there on the internet that um, ask you to try to establish an identity, the one that... Um, does the best job right now in uh, really sort of incentivizing and making it hard for a person to make multiple identities because it challenges you to put your face there is Facebook. And I would say Facebook right now is um, an actually a fairly reliable way to um, uh, to get um, if you ask people to log into something using their Facebook account, it's a fairly uh, reliable way to make sure it's one account per person. Um, and uh, so anyways, um, uh, and, and I guess I'll, I'll just expand on that a little bit. Um, if you think about it, if you imagine a, a community say a, a town, let's say a town actually started to use um, a hive network and they actually started to uh, respect what the hive came up with as answers to questions. Like a town was deciding should we pass a school bond and instead of just relying on the democratic voting process they actually were relying on this the hive um, uh, connectivity, the hive mind of their town to come up with an answer. Maybe a school bond's not a good idea, but a good example, but deciding whether or not they should uh, do something to block a Walmart being built or, or something like that, um, any sort of question. If they were relying on this hive um, and they actually cared about what it came up with, then they would suddenly care whether or not anyone was gaming the system with multiple identities. Now, in the hive, if everyone has to show their face with the node, 
then it starts to become much more difficult to game the system and create 100 fake accounts. If Because if suddenly, if someone sees 100 accounts with the same picture, well, obviously, that would be a problem. You see 100 accounts with no picture, that also would be a, um, a, uh, a red flag for the hive. Um, if you see 100 accounts with pictures of people that no one in the hive has seen before or knows, and, you know, obviously if their names are also shared and no one can actually see these names listed as living in the uh, city or county, that's another red flag. So by using Facebook, asking people what is your name and what is your, and uh, show a picture of yourself, which is basically what Facebook does, it gives you um, a little bit, uh, it creates it more difficult to really game the system when it starts to matter. When it starts to matter, it'll be hard to game the system. So... That in mind, Hive One is built using Facebook login. To go into, to actually participate in the Hive, you do have to log in with Facebook. Um, uh, you can go in and see some of what's going on without that. Uh, and so, uh, and that's actually only the first, in terms of identity and trust. We'll call that level one. Level one is. Facebook login. But there are different levels. There are more ideas of things we can do. Another level we can go to is vouching. People can vouch for the identity of others and say, I know this is Joe Smith and this is his only account on the network and 10 people could vouch for that. And so eventually we'll be able to allow people to create accounts on the network without using Facebook. Um, and we'll just have a vouching system that lets people uh, vouch for people. And that's that's probably also will be pretty reliable. And what's another idea? Oh, another uh, level we could take this to is we might create sub parts of the hive, um, say networks in here, we, where we really want to know for sure um, something about the people going in. Then we might ask people to do something like, uh, you know, actually record a video introducing themselves, a video ID. So they're literally saying, hey, I'm Matt Reddy, and I am this identity on the Hive network, and um, maybe even like uh, some other identifying um, item about them. And maybe that self-identifying video is only visible to other people in that portion of the Hive that have identified themselves. So in any case, I know there's some people that are going to be annoyed with the using Facebook as a login, but um, again, this is a first experiment where we are trying to start building um, at least a first hive mind of humanity. And this is just the first of what will be quite a number of experiments. Um, I have a number, there's a lot of different ways you can design this hive, and every um, if you go on to Hive One, you'll see I've made a certain decisions about how it's going to function, the interface, and every time I make a decision, that's a possible branch of a different way to design the Hive. And so I'm going to actually be designing different Hives with different design features, and eventually I will be inviting people to start taking the software that I've designed, the Hive software, and branching it off to different uh, forms and different uh, setups. And so what we'll end up having is we'll have, you know, one hive here designed in a certain way. Then we'll have another hive over here designed in a different way with different rules. And then we'll have another hive over here just experimenting on different ways of working. And what I'm, I'm hoping will happen as we grow and do this is that every time someone attempts to start to, to make a hive, that we keep all these hives connected to each other and communicating. And so it sort of becomes a hive of hives. And as other nations on Earth create hives, of course, we're going to have to have hives that are using different um, base languages. But the key is every time we create a hive that we keep the hives in communication 
and we keep them learning from each other. And they're going to be disagreeing. I mean, some of these hives, because they're going to have different rules. Some of these, you're going to, you know, you, we might, uh, or the, the, you know, mainstream opinion might trust some hives more than others. Like this hive over here might have a very, uh, a very weak identity verification system while this one has a very rigorous identity verification system and that's okay so you'll have sort of like sort of more dark chaotic anonymous parts of the human hive mind and you'll have those where it's filled with people that have truly identified themselves you know maybe like public figures and celebrities would probably you know as they do on Facebook and Twitter they make a big effort to make sure they know what identities on Twitter and Facebook really are them and which one are uh, fake uh, made by other people and that's going to be a battle that's going to go on for forever that there's always going to be the possibility of people lying about their identity online but the the idea is you just need to have uh, um, some places where you have pretty solid uh, solid identities um, so that the hive can function in those areas and you know in these dark chaotic places where anonymity is more possible and gaming the system is more possible, there's probably stuff to learn from those places in a hive mind also. Okay, well, that is my little video explanation of what I'm doing with the hive system. And now I've got to decide who I'm going to share this video with. If you have any thoughts or questions or you want to get involved, then you can find me at hive1.net um, or at the globalconsensusproject.org There you are. Maybe I'll uh, hear from you. Thanks.